Hello everyone and welcome back to my Mars colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. In this episode we begin by launching a truss and then a Phobos lander to our Mars transfer vehicle number 2. So instead of putting a lander that will land on Mars itself, which is a little bit risky since we haven't actually managed to test that properly yet, I've decided to launch a lander that will land on Phobos and Deimos. And so the Kerbals that we send to Mars on this Mars transfer vehicle will be able to conduct those missions, explore Phobos and Deimos a little bit, and then, uh, well, hopefully we can also get those scanners to figure out good landing sites. This lander does not have any sort of ISRU unit, so it's just carrying its fuel. It doesn't take that much fuel to land on both Phobos and Deimos anyway, so I expect it'll be enough. So there's basically a stripped down sort of lander, not any parachutes, no heat shield, and uh, keeping it simple for this particular mission. And you can see a truss adapter there for one of the tugs. We needed one of these adapters on the Mars transfer vehicle. We already have one up there so that tugs can be put into position and used as orbital maneuvering systems. Now, you may have noticed that this video is fairly short and people have been asking me to keep the video short. I'm not entirely sure that's the best strategy, to be honest. I have made quite a few Kerbal Space Program videos and there isn't exactly a good correlation between video length and how many views I get, to be honest. But, uh, well, if you want short videos, that's fine. There's no bottom limit to how short I can make them. Uh, there is an upper limit for them because I just don't have enough time. And really, the amount of time I spend in-game and editing for each video is the same no matter what. The difference between the videos where they're longer and the videos where they're shorter is that the longer ones have some sort of issue that I'm troubleshooting. Um, it doesn't matter whether I'm troubleshooting a mod or troubleshooting the vehicle in-game, you know, you know, dealing with in-game dynamics. To me, it's both the same. And I understand people see them both differently, but as far as I'm concerned, the troubleshooting process is the same and that's the interesting part to me. Uh, my philosophy is that I'm not really interested in doing things that I've already got down perfectly. I'm trying to work things out. And so I'm trying to work out the mods. I'm trying to work out my own parts. Obviously, these are a lot of these are parts that I created. And I'm trying to work out the mission concept, as it were. And if I think that I've got a particular mission concept down, I'll just move on to a different concept. I'm not going to repeat the same thing over again. So we obviously didn't have this mission concept down last time, so that's why we're doing it again this time with some modifications. But once this seems to work, we'll probably elaborate more. For instance, using like a nuclear thermal rocket and such. But that comes later. Uh, people have asked me, you know, um, how many colonists do you plan to bring on to Mars? I have no idea. I mean, this isn't... Uh, I, I, I'm trying to work through things. I'm not looking to the destination necessarily. It's the journey that counts. So anyway, here we are. The tug that put the truss into that position can just stay there. That's its appropriate place. Uh, we're getting the lander docked up now on the opposite side of the supplies and the quest airlock. And then we'll move that tug to the back to its appropriate location. And mainly this video is cycling the big vehicles up to high orbit. And I had to basically end this one by the time they got there because after that we have to time warp like 300 days to when everything goes out to Mars. And I need to do some building of craft what I want to send on this particular flotilla or whatever you want to call it, sortie to Mars. I need to make sure all the other launches are going to be good. And basically next time we'll be focusing on those launches. Well, we'll probably be resupplying the two vehicles, the supply vehicle and the Mars transfer vehicle, making sure they're topped up on fuel first. But after that, we are basically going to be doing Mars launches again. So our stint at Earth is nearly at an end. We will go back to focusing on the journey to Mars and reaching Mars and all that business pretty soon. I'll try and expedite the refueling process. I am working on the hydrogen oxygen rocket I talked about that will be much larger than the Sajita rocket. And yeah, we'll see how that works out. I sort of previewed the basic concept during a live stream and uh, I think it'll work out nicely. 
So here I'm making sure that our engineer from the Quest Airlock gets back into the Lynx spacecraft coming back down. And we are undocking here, making sure that we've got all four Kerbals. We don't want any Kerbals getting irradiated during the long process of getting the Mars Trans vehicle to high orbit. And here is the deep orbit burn. I did transfer methane and oxygen from this to the Mars Transfer Vehicle as much as I thought was okay. We still had probably more Delta V than we needed in the service module here. But it has served us well. I'm pondering whether to recolor the shell on top of this. I've developed a sort of black tile texture for my um, for the Shinkansen space plane to replace its current black texture on the bottom. The, the new texture looks a little bit better. Ironically, it's actually tiles. <laughs> it's a, it's an actually uh, black tile texture. Uh, so not heat tiles, I mean actual flooring tiles, but it's okay. Uh, so I'm pondering whether to use the same texture for to replace the white on this, because really it's supposed to be HRSI tiles as well. Orion is too, by the way, and before they paint it, if they paint it. Otherwise, it is covered in black tiles. So, sort of the same idea. I've been meaning to make the spacecraft look a little bit better, and I think the Shinkansen space plane definitely does look better now. I'll probably make a video of that soon. That eventually will be involved in this series, if you've seen those videos. Uh, it is capable of, if refueled, rendezvousing with the Mars transfer vehicles in high orbit and then returning to low orbit. And then being reused in low orbit, being topped off with fuel by the hydrogen-oxygen rocket I'm designing. Uh, here I separate the aero cap and it explodes. Hopefully it never takes out the parachutes in that situation or like the capsule or anything. So far it's okay, but that's something else I need to work on, the colliders there. And yeah, some colliders are definitely colliding. Well, parachute deployment. And at this stage, I was thinking about the radiation belts because, again, we're bringing them back down to make sure that these Kerbals avoid the radiation belts. And I'm going to be cycling the missions up. And I wanted to see how high I needed to put them to keep them safe. The problem is that magnetopause. And I could have sworn the magnetopause didn't have as much radiation as the inner and outer Van Allen belts. But if you look at the numbers on the side there, it looks like it has just about the same. And it extends pretty high up there. So no matter what we're going to do, it's going to be passing through it as long as we're in line with the moon. Obviously, if I wasn't in line with the moon, which is in line roughly with the ecliptic with all the other planets, which is convenient... Um, then I wouldn't be passing through it if it was if we were highly inclined, like if we were launching from Baikonur or something. But we are not highly inclined, and probably being highly inclined would complicate matters for transferring to Mars just a little bit. Um, so, yeah, the magneto pause is giving me pause. I'm worried about that, but. The best way to find out its effects is to have Kerbals go up and see if they get baked by the radiation. Anyway, uh, I decided to plot for Mars at low Earth orbit just as a reference. We're going to have to get rid of that maneuver because it's not going to be relevant in high orbit. But I just wanted to see how much delta V would be necessary and what the timing was. So here we go with the ion engines, cycling this up and using that xenon gas. This was not topped off beforehand, so it only had like half tanks of xenon gas. But that's good enough. Still takes like 5,000, 6,000 meters per second to do this. And now with the nuclear reactor, it's not favoring the light side. It's just perfectly circular, more or less, because it's got power all the way around. And you can see where we've got it there. It, the last time I brought it up to 60,000 kilometers. And this time I was just aiming to get out of the inner and outer belts convincingly. And, you know, even 60,000 kilometers wouldn't completely get out of the magnetopause. So I decided to stop it right there at about 30,000, still less than geosynchronous orbit. And we'll see. Yeah, uh, we'll probably send Kerbals up there to check it out. 
Then I replotted for Mars to see how much delta V we would need now. And it's about 1,400 less. Obviously we spent more just cycling up to this, but 2,100 is not too bad. The more important thing is how much delta V is it gonna take to capture around Mars given this transfer. And so I checked that out. And as it turns out, pretty reasonable, 900 only. Much, much, much less than last time. So I'm figuring we're gonna send a lot of stuff to Mars on this trip. And maybe a lot of stuff that's gonna capture with propulsion because if it's only gonna cost 900, it probably is better just to use propulsive capture instead of the heat shield. Anyway, next up, I had to get the Mars transfer vehicle up to that orbit. And you'll know I had the far statistics there and that's because I was trying to use the reaction wheels on the Mars transfer vehicle number two to turn to prograde, but I got impatient. It was turning too slowly. Heck, even with RCS, it turns too slowly. I wish I could use the reaction wheels to turn it, but um, th that doesn't work during time warp. So uh, it turns too slow. Uh, I mean, persistent rotation works during time warp, but the reaction wheels operate so weakly that even persistent rotation will stop the rotation during time warp. So no luck there. Anyway, uh, RCS brought to the point and we are using the little ion engines with a reactor again, but also with the solar panels. So we're fully powered, more power than we need. And uh, yep, heading out to the same orbit, 30,000 kilometers, because eventually I would like to rendezvous the two craft with each other just so that we can take a picture or something, right? Uh, it'll be nice to get them in render range of each other, high over the earth, and I think that'll look good just for kicks. Also, I have edited the Lynx spacecraft's shell so that it's backward facing colliders. The colliders that are currently over the hatch on the, the cabin portion, the cabin portion has a hatch that they can exit, but the shell for the orbital version had colliders all around. I removed the colliders over the hatch so that now they can EVA with the orbiter version of the Lynx spacecraft. So we can do that mission where we remove the, um, the docking port, the stray docking port that's on the supply vessel, but it'll be better to do that if the supply vessel is in render range of the Mars transfer vehicle and then it'll be easier for the Kerbals to get from one to the other to do that job. So anyway, uh, you'll note that Mars has its own little radiation thing going <laughs> and uh, the bumpy sort of awkward thing. wonder how they made that. It's not the easiest mathematical construct, but anyway, I wonder if the, I don't think the number varies within it. It's just a set number for each density for the inner, outer, and magnetopause, but not entirely sure about that. So the situation for this one is about the same as for the supply vessel. Actually, the capture takes less. I think it's only 800 something meters per second. So that's really good. In fact, we can easily do that just with the methane and oxygen we're carrying. So we're in good shape. Uh, this seems like a very favorable transfer, which is on the other hand, not great for testing things because you know we're gonna have much worse transfers later on. So this is a nice transfer and might be a little bit deceptive, but we'll go with it. We'll, we'll try and send as much as possible. I have to cook up all the other missions. Some of them will be reworks of the missions we launched last time that didn't quite work out. And others will be expansions on ideas. I might want to land the base on Phobos and Deimos for the Kerbals to visit, give them something to do. I, I'll think about all of that. So that's why that's one reason why this video is short because getting it to this point, we have to time warp now and we're gonna soon begin launching stuff. So anyway, with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time.